All right, let's get started. Um, we got some new faces here. Those of you guys who are hanging out with us, I'll tell our students first. visitors who want to hang out with us and it's exciting because it gives us a chance to talk about uh, the names that exist on our land and whose land is where and uh, we talk we don't just talk carelessly when we talk about the names of our ancestors and the names that they put onto this land long time ago they really knew how to live how to survive in, in various places and uh, there was a man named Kajak T. It was Walter Sobolov. I think he was 101, maybe, when he said, um, He said, This wonderful thing that was born on this earth that helped them survive, our ancestors. And he was talking about the Clinket language. Uh, so we're in semester four of Clinket, so we got our foot on the gas pedal. We'll take it off for a second, which will probably be nice for everybody. Give everybody a bit of a mental break. Although we're gonna spend about half an hour at the end of class doing just some hardcore verb stuff, because that's where, that's where we're at. Uh, Clinket, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the Clinket language and stuff. But I guess we should go around and just do a brief introduction. Uh, just tell us who you are, maybe where you're from. And uh, one thing that's good about the world. How about that? That's pretty general. And we, oh, those of you, here's the disclaimer. These classes are recorded so that other people can learn what we're trying to learn. They're put onto YouTube. Uh, but don't worry about it. If you're uncomfortable with that, just let me know. Uh, but you're in here, so you should know that that's something that's going to happen. We've got some folks who are online in various places, and you'll get a chance to hear from them. So who wants to, Oh, I guess I should go first. I'm Anchorage, on plane. Akaya Yehatu Wawat Aka Awe Minnesota Day Schoon Plain, Atuna Haya Hagut, Ha Fairbanks, Ha Havai, A Sinkit Yohatangi Stuchas to Ha Kai Hasha to Naskina Hawaya Hitki to Sinkit Yohatangi Tin has to in Yohatanich. My name is Hone. And uh, you guys are in my clinic class, so that's just what you're going to have to call me now. And uh, I was born in Skagway, grew up in Anchorage, went to college in Minnesota, Fairbanks, and University of Hawaii at Hilo. 
which was the best out of all of them. And uh, I study and teach the Clinket language. I've got three kids, a wife. We, uh, I speak to them only in Clinket. It's very fun. Who wants to go first? Okay. You know? okay. Uh, uh, Brave or wants to go first? 
Ye had to a sock, Elise, or uh, Anna Hook, Flake Ka, Henach, Elise, um, Juno, or sure, Hatsati. Sorry, I'm homesick. <laughs> go ahead, Juan. Let's go next. Kleinach, Dachnach, Naskinach, Dakuni, Nachoich, was a teen. You had to a sock, a great car in a Cassie little field, you had to a sock, a cogwantan, a hut, a knahadi, a hut, a sheet, coke, ye had your tea, and plain cooked tea. Okay, cheese. Slachter Ush is in Sitka, Cassie Bowfield, Born Shana Kate, you cut to a sock. Plate Ka Kinach, Kim Perkins, you cut to a sock. Sheet Ka Kwan Ayachat, Chak Na Chat City. Kiksari Yeri Ayachat, Ka Guantan Ayachat, Gunas Chish. Yekecha. Uh, Chukan Yuchat do a sock, the Kalk in a Krisha Brady, Yuchat do a sock, she could corner test microphone. Ach, G. That's the Krisha, she's in Sitka and Chish. What's a clean ach, I you that you to a guess a go high in Kayanigi, a do so a water Tish, Kianu de Gado Echsai, a key ye hat ye tea has caught the tea who had the tea in the school district. A Tignachshaya Yak dot dach Gunahu Kwanaya, a unguage cook the tea coa, a goe kehut uwa wet. A clear good Kadarsi, what's a Shankadi Nahu city? Joy Shankadi, a dear Hayah had Gunnish cheese. Oh, yeah, okay, ha, Gunnish cheese. Ah, that's everything that we all know each other. Okay, bye, I wish with this cool. So, thinking about uh, clinkets and like longevity. And also endangerment. These are some things we think about with the Clinket language. Uh, it's been in this particular place for about 10, 15,000 years. Uh, we've got songs and names that go back to uh, past ice ages and, and other types of things. Uh, it's a very complex language. If you like to think about stuff, if you like to solve puzzles, if you like to be confused, this is the thing for you. Uh, we put all of our stuff, I put all of my stuff on the website, quinketlanguage.com. You can watch every class I've taught in the past almost four years now. Uh, you can look at a bunch of resources. You, this, Gabby was talking about having books. It's so wonderful, we used to have to pack everything everywhere. Back in my day, we had rotary phones. Uh, but we had 
And now you can just put everything on your phone. You can look up everything on your phone. It's just amazing. Uh, there's probably 60 fully fluent speakers of Clinkit. Maybe. That's probably being optimistic. Uh, there's a, a handful of people, as we can hear, who have learned to speak it as second language speakers. It's very exciting. Uh, if we sort of look, um, let me try and zoom in on this map here. This is Clinkit territory right here. So it's this, the majority of Southeast Alaska is, is Clinkit. It's a very large uh, land base. It's larger than uh, maybe 20 out of the 50 states in the United States. It crosses into what is now Canada. There were four uh, major dialects of Clinkit. One of them is gone. Three remain. Uh, the main difference between some of the dialects is vowels is a big thing. Uh, in terms of one vowel sounds like this and another place it sounds like that. And also tone. So some of the things that are fun about Clinkit, let's get our little snow thing up here. So we're going to talk about snow. Snow is a really neat sort of starting point and it's fitting because it's snowing outside. And so some people like to kind of make a bit of a big deal about indigenous languages having lots of words for snow when any language that has a regular encounter with snow has lots of words for snow. There's just like wet snow, dry snow, damp. They're, they're just in a lot of indigenous languages, that's all that's going on. But some of the differences between uh, some of the Germanic languages and some of the European languages and Na Native American languages, Native American languages are commonly what we call polysynthetic, which means there's a whole bunch of little things that get glued together, and those things either mean something or do something grammatically. Whereas English, they're usually separate words. Words don't usually run into each other. So that's one of the things that gets people hung up. So they'll see this word that's really long, they'll freak out. But when you, you realize it's a series of things that you're saying, and once you sort of compartmentalize it, it starts to make a little bit more sense. Uh, so we're not going to do uh, a whole lot on pronunciation. We'll go through the alphabet, and we'll show it to you guys. I don't expect you to sound like a clinkit speaker. I'm not going to correct your pronunciation at all. We're just going to move through this stuff at a conceptual level, but also say, this stuff is here. You want to learn this stuff, you totally can. This is something that you can't learn anywhere else. right? And so it's really interesting to think about. Our languages uh, all across North America are deeply rooted into a particular place. You want to talk about like, getting to know a particular place, the language actually there's concepts that are really hard uh, to sort of process if you only speak uh, one language, and especially if that language is English, especially if it's American English and you're in America, because that language has a big, long history, and that history is very troubled. That history has to do with trying to eliminate hundreds of languages, and it's done so rather successfully. So some of the things that we try to do is say, no, you know, there's lots of amazing stuff in here. And we had a Gwich'in speaker who came and visited one of our classes one time. His name was Randall Tetlichi. And I said, yeah, you want to just come share something? And he came. He was listening to us, you know, practice and do stuff. And he, he said, when I was born in Old Crow, he was talking about this. He said, the people lived so much longer than they do now. He says, when I was a young man, I used to go visit people. They'd be so old, they'd just crawl around their house. And I had to think, I was like, wow, I guess I never thought. I never thought about that. And he said, but they, they just lived a really good, healthy life. And he says, from the time I was about six years old, I could go just about anywhere. As long as I could see the village, I could go anywhere I wanted to on my own. My parents just said, you know the land, go ahead. And that amazed me as well. I got a six-year-old, I don't let her out the front door, right? Not unless I'm, I'm going to be there or the watch, there's a yard. So it's a, different, it's a different relationship with the land. But he said, you guys are probably worried that a lot of your old people are, are dying. 
And that may be one of your concerns, is that their wisdom is going with them. And he said, we believe that when our, when our old people die, their wisdom goes right back into the land. You go out on that land, you speak your own language, and it comes, in, it comes to you in a dream. I think about that stuff, and it's really interesting to learn Clinket and to talk about Clinket knowledge, because in a place like this, which is academia, and I think, I don't know what your relationship is to a university, but a university is often a place where they say this stuff is in, this stuff is out. This stuff is what we consider real, this stuff is what we consider fake. And if we say, oh yeah, I, I learned that in a dream, that's probably not considered good rigorous studies from an academic perspective. And so sometimes this information gets treated, you know, there's, they say there's science and then there's indigenous knowledge. Mm -hmm. And they act like they're such different things. But it's just acquiring knowledge through different means. For us, somebody went out and they saw a brown bear putting skunk cabbage on his wounds. That's how we knew that it was medicine. So with Clinket people, if you knew this language, you knew this, and you got hurt out there on the land, you would know what to do. And a lot of it would be you wouldn't fix yourself. You would ask someone who's maybe an opposite clan to help you. They'll walk out there, they'll find that thing that you need. That's just something we know. But it's something that doesn't always translate well to, to sciences at times. Our language is a very scientific language. If we look at the things that go on in our language, as you're about to see, there's a bunch of stuff that happens, how things interact in very certain in predictable ways but also ways that'll... We're going over some grammar stuff. We had some elders in the room up in Whitehorse. So when he stopped me, he's like, that's the way. Chua ya, achtun de ta ni kam dhaki sakai wu tin. Yeah. He says, it's as if my mind got tangled in a sane net. And this is what grammar does, because people use language, but they don't have to think about grammar, right? And so once you, when you grow up in a language, you don't have to analyze how that language works. But if you want to put another language into your consciousness and, have, and be able to think in that language, then you have to know how languages work at some level. You'll be comparing things. Someone's like, well, we say it this way, and then it's said this way. But then there'll be things where it's, like we were just talking today, I don't know of a word for responsibility in clinking. We don't have a word for artwork. I mean, we had to make one. A long time ago, we didn't have a word for artwork. Because we just, everything we made was just amazing. They just decorated it. They just made everything amazing. And so it's just stuff to think about. So let's, here's our first word. So this is this kind of fun word? Uh, and there's lots of things that we can do with this particular word. This is the stuff that's falling from the sky right now. And when we talk about it, we call it glade. 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 So that is snow, and that's also the color white. So in Clinket, this is where, you know, so like colors. There's a language that I was studying. Yeah, I don't know the language, but it was in Papua New Guinea, which is the most linguistic, diverse place on the planet. Very small land base, about 800 languages. Uh, the most diverse place in North America was probably California. Hundreds of languages, a little over 100 languages in that small place. How many Alaska Native languages are there? If you already know, you can't say. I mean, if you're one of my students, you can't say, because I told you. 16. It's more than that. Huh? 80. Less than that. 50. Less than that. 34. Less than that. 25. Less than that. We're getting real close. 22. There are 20 Alaska native languages. There are 20. There are probably 22 at some point. We know of one for sure that's gone. Uh, nobody speaks it anymore. And they're all extremely endangered. I would say over half of them have under 100 speakers. They, are, they come from four language families. So like it has, so, but 
it's interesting because there are some, like I have heard, if you learned Atna, you could speak Dena'in. Like they're just, they're almost the same thing. Uh, same with Southern Toshoni and um, Tagish. They're very similar as well. But if you learn Klinkit, there's no other language in the world that you could talk to. Like Atna people and Dena'ina people, could they could talk to each other in their language. Right, so we call this being mutually intelligible. So if you spoke Spanish, you could learn French pretty easy. It's not to say they're the same language. You couldn't sit down and just talk to each other. But it would be easier to learn French when if you knew Spanish than it would be to learn Japanese. Right, just because the patterns are there already. Because at one point, they were the same language. So you get four in Alaska. All around the coast was one big language family. If you start at the south central part of Alaska, you go all the way over to Greenland and also to some parts of eastern Russia. They were all the same language a long time ago. The northern part, uh, I'll have to look, Shana Kate, I'll have to look up. It was called, I can't remember what it was called, Setalt, I think? I got it wrong. But the language that was gone in Alaska was in between Coast Simshian and Clinket territories. There's a canal right up behind Ketchikan, and there was a whole group of people, and they, most of them, I think, probably became Nishka, and some of them became Clinket. Uh, the second language family is called Na Dene. It's all these interior Dene languages, Clinket, Iyak, and then a whole bunch of languages in the interior of the Yukon, and then we're related to languages down by Oregon, California, and uh, Navajo and Apache. I think a long time ago we were all down there in Navajo country. Um, and then the, the third and fourth, there's Simshian. Uh, so Simshianic languages are Coast Simshian, uh, Nishka, and Gitkasan. Coast Simshian is called Smalgech. Uh, those three are three different languages. But I think if you learned one, you could learn the other two pretty quick. And then Haida, which is not related to any language in the entire world, as far as anybody knows. So this is the Klingit alphabet. So you've got a bunch of sounds. You have 58 letters. Every letter more or less represents one sound. So this, I'm going to grab a mark. So, um, this is something that Clinkit has that maybe English doesn't. So in English, you can do things like GH, right? So GH, has, I was teaching a class one time, I was trying to, I was trying to pick on anybody, but I said, well, English got a lot of letters that it doesn't need, right? Like the letter C. Nobody needs the letter C, because it could be just be a K or a CH, just have those two, or an S. And then somebody said, well, my name starts with the letter C. I was like, okay, we'll keep your name. We'll get rid of C. <laughs> so what kind of sound does G-H make in English? What's that? Like an F sound? Like in tough? What else? Silent, like through. Yeah, through. So it makes this oo sound, right? It makes an O sound. Through, though, bow, tough, hiccup. There's a couple more, right? So with Clinkit, Clinkit is very complicated as far as the way it sounds. Reading and writing is, is really it's easy once you get it. Reading and writing in English is not so easy, right? Because like, there's just certain things. So we call them phonetic alphabets, right? They, they, there's a sound, one sound, one symbol relationship, right? Like the letter O could be like in T-O, it's two. Right? And W O M E N, it's women. It's an I sound. It's an I sound. Right? So, thinking about this, what Klinga has is vowels and consonants. What's a vowel? What's a consonant? Real? So, a vowel has like two sounds, a long and a short. And a consonant generally just has one. Yeah, that's a, that's a good start. Yeah, so basically, a vowel, usually there's nothing that impedes the airflow, right? So when you go, uh, 
<laughs> there's a native comedian named Don Bernstick. He says, he's like, well, you guys, you guys got your vowels. You got your A, E, I, O, U, sometimes Y. He's like, we indigenous people, we got our own vowels. He's like, E, I, O, U, A. Sometimes, <laughs> why? <laughs> <laughs> so, but a vowel just means nothing stops the airflow. Right, so ah, a, e, ah. It's just airflow, vocal cords. Consonant means something impedes or stops the airflow. Right, so any of those sounds, there's something that stops or impedes the airflow. You got friction stuff, you got all kinds of things that you can look at. How these sounds are made. There's other things, there could be clicks, there could be a lot of different things, a lot of different ways that people make noise. Those noises come together to make the language. So click it, if you look at the vowels, there's four vowels, but they each have four variations. Klinka loves the number four. Klinka also loves categories. So when the board, the variations are going to be short and long and high and low. So Klinka has tone in the language. So language is not just, you know, there's words, there's sounds, there's emotion, there's volume, there's stress. And this is how you communicate. This is how you, you just know how to do this stuff. But if you learn other languages, you realize, oh, there's, there's a lot of stuff I gotta think about. Right? Because the way you would, you would signal uh, uncertainty, right? So if I said, how many languages are Alaskan? And you said, 20. That means like you know, right? <laughs> We say, how many languages are Alaskan? He said, 30? Right, so that little upward turn is like, maybe, right? You just kind of say, I don't know. But you can't do that in other languages, right? So like in Hawaiian, so in, in English, this is a question. In Hawaiian, this is a question. And then click it, this is a question. Like I, <laughs> I put something in there to make it a question because it has tone. So you can't mess with the tone or you change the meaning. So these are some things just to think about. Okay, I'm gonna show you what these, we're gonna do these uh, sounds. So this first one, uh. 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 And I'm gonna just put a vowel on the end of these consonants. Ch. 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 Uh. So this one, whenever you see an apostrophe after a vowel and clink it, that means you're going to make that consonant without using your lungs. And so these are, these are interesting things. Um, why do people talk with their hands? For expression. For expression. There's another, there's another reason too. And some people are more like they exaggerate. Emphasis. What's that? Emphasis. Yeah. Emphasis, right? And your your hands can also communicate other things, right? Like, apologize for this, but I would say, hey, great job, right? Yeah. So that I'm communicating two things, right? But also, your hands are used as a timing mechanism for your body because it's letting it know, okay, lungs, this is what you got to do because breathing is natural. Speech is. Speech takes a lot of effort, right? So with this, when you see these ones, you're cutting off your lungs. You say, don't need your lungs, I'm just gonna make this with my throat. So that's why you go from ch to ch 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 Pretending to drink water or something. 
Those ones are fun. Those two, this one and this one and that one and that one. They're really fun. Right? And so uh, when we talk about these, I gotta be near this microphone, sorry. Uh, okay, so going over to here. So this is an L, but there's no voiced L in clinky. There's a voiced L in Haida. So you can go la and you can go la. But the unvoiced L, uh, you basically put your L, it's, you put your tongue in your mouth like you're gonna make the L sound, but you blow out the sides of your mouth. And you relax, you gotta relax your face when you speak clinky. I think English is all in the front of the lip, so you shake English out at your lips, it's really hard to do. But you can speak clinky totally without your lips. I remember I saw this guy, and he would get these great speeches. His name was Oscar Clarence Jackson. He would stand there and he would do this thing, and he had these big, like, strong hands, and he would be like, pushing them on the table, and he would have his teeth to, like, push together. And he'd never separate his teeth. And he would just talk and clink it. It was just really amazing. But the, the hardest job in the world would be to be a clink it lip reader because you never close your mouth. When you, you don't have to. Like, you don't make the P or the B or the F or the V sound, right? You, you just don't make those sounds. And so you don't need to close your lips to speak clinking. But to make this sound, it sounds like this. Sha. Sha. And then this one, you get your tongue in that position and you squish. And you get air squishing up the sides of their mouth. And this is the one where if you eat like some delicious herring eggs, you might just spray it on somebody's face. Uh. 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 Na. Na. Sa. 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 Sha. Sha. Ta. 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 So we have an underlined X, and people get them confused all the time. So they'll when they should have, and it's a big difference, right? Because I could say yekayayayachana, that means this is a good evening. Or if I say yekayayayachana, this is a good sweetheart, right? And so like now the scandal erupts. You'll be like, I thought he was married, right? And so the. But the first one, just the X sound. Like if you're gonna make, let's say you're a sound effects person. And we say, okay, oh, hey, sound effects person. It was a windy night, make the wind. And you go <laughs> That's like the white noise on the TV. Like I don't think they have that anymore. This is digital TV upstairs, and it does like the white fuzzy stuff, but it's all digital. I was like, why did they do that? <laughs> um, and it's also the cappuccino machine. <laughs> That's the X sound. So we go, ha, ha, ha. And if we put an apostrophe, we get, ha, 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 And oh, the can of whipped cream sound. Wonderful. That's another great one. Sheesh. Now with the underline, now we get the full, this is, uh, I practice it every night when I'm snoring. Ha. 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 Or in England, they use these a lot, right? Like, bloody. Right. So that little, that stops, the glottal stop. That's all the sounds in clinking, right? So there's, there's 58 of them. The ones in orange, you don't find in English. Those tend to be the ones that get people hung up a little bit. Some of them a little bit more than others. Um, with cream. Nice. Okay. So let's talk about some snow. So here's some snow terms. Uh, and for the students who've been doing this for a little while, 
uh, some of the things that we that I did here. So you got on column one here, you've got the word. In column two, you got the breakdown. But we're just starting to sort of break these things down a lot. And so when we talk about it, it's a bunch of little parts put together. These are the little, what we'd like to do is break them apart and then show what those little parts mean. So this is somewhere in the middle. So I don't like show you what all those little parts mean because we're going to talk about them uh, over these next couple weeks. But it does show you how you would blow those things up. There's a bunch of invisible things in Clinkit. Other things that are really neat in Clinkit is how pronouns work. So pronouns are like when you sort of say instead of a noun, so you could say like Kone uh, kicked the chair, but then you could say he kicked the chair, or you say he kicked it. So they could stand in place of a noun. So in Clinkit, uh, there's these ones that are just, we call them the zero marker, right? So you could say uh, I kicked it, you kicked it, she kicked it, we kicked it, y'all kicked it, they kicked it, it was kicked. Those are the kind of types of pronouns that Clinkit has. But when you use Clinkit grammar, if we were to use Clinkit grammar to speak English, I would say, I kicked it, you kicked it, kicked it. So we don't even have to say it's she. Also, the pronoun for he or she is ungendered in Clinkit, right? So you just say, ho, 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 ho. Right, so there we have ungendered pronouns, but we also have ones where the pronoun just kind of disappears. It doesn't. You, once you just say "kicked it," we just know that that's she or he. So those are some concepts that get really fun for people. They're really tricky. I like to say fun and tricky and interesting, and it really just means hard. <laughs> but don't tell anyone. Right, it's my secret. Okay, and then over here on the left, on the right. You've got the translation. So the first one we already said it. Glate. 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 And if something is white, we could say glate yachyati. Glate yachyati. Glate yachyati. So Clinkit has no actual words for any colors at all. It's really, you just say, it's like, so this would be like a jade stone. This would be like a cloud or maybe a baby seagull. Um, if I've got something with a bunch of different colors on it here, like the blue would be like a Stellar's jade. Uh, this would be like snow. This would be like silver. And so there's everything, this yachyati, you learn a bunch of, but there's specific nouns. There's lots of them. But the other thing that you notice with Clinkit is if you study the old people that have been recorded over the years, nobody really cares what color anything is, right? This is just not a Clinkit thing. And so if I analyzed a whole bunch of different recordings and I just found, like they'd say, white sand or you know, white people with Clinkit ha, uh, and that's, but it's in the modern, sort of in the post-contact times, we use them quite a bit, right? So we use them a lot, but traditionally we, we don't really care. We don't care really what, I mean, maybe we care because we got like amazing artwork, totem poles and stuff. We'd make our paints and we'd do all kinds of things, but uh, you know, it wasn't as important as it is now, right? So then when it's snowing, so now you see that late is there as a noun, and so, yacheti is a verb, which is to be like something, right? So you could say, for example, kut uh, that's that means it's like a whirlpool, kut And this is an answer for like, uh, someone's like, how's it going? Wasaeti, kut yacheti akustik. My life is chaos. It's a big mess. Right, so it could be a mess, it could be fun, it could be funny. There's a lot of things that Clinkit does through tone, just the way that you talk as well. There's lots of funny stuff in Clinkit, lots of joking. Uh, it could also get very serious, it could also get very medicinal. When something big happens, you expect it to, somebody needs to stand up and talk on this thing. 
right? Like let's say some, somebody that we know got really hurt and we're thinking about them. Somebody would stand up and say something. And the types of language they would use would really sort of be like a medicine for the people that are worried and for the person who's, who's out there struggling. In Clinkit, we talk to everything. We talk to, we talk to the bears, we talk to the trees, we talk to, and then there's different ways to encounter that. And we're conscious too, we're careful, because people would call us primitive all the time. But they just never tried to understand who we were and what we we're doing. They just assumed that they knew what was right and what was wrong, what was smart and what wasn't. But there's ways that we talk to these things. Sometimes we might see a bear and we would talk to it. We would say, so we would talk to that bear very respectfully. Once you you never disrespect an animal. So if you saw a bear, you would say, "Please forgive me. This is your home. I'm just here because I'm going after the food that my ancestors would eat." Or maybe I'm going for medicines. And I say, my children, they, they like to eat this food. I don't want you to hurt me. I don't want anything to happen. And this is the way Klinka people have lived with, with bears for forever. Then there's other ways that we talk to them, too. Like sometimes even before we see them, we'll talk to them. We'll say, so hoots is the word for bear. We'll say hoots kwani, which means the brown bear people. And that's when we would ask them. We would just sort of, a lot of times we're going berry picking, something, bring a bunch of kids. And we would just say, we don't want anything to happen to us. And just by talking to them, we'll make those things, they'll make them okay. And they would tease us too when we were learning language. We'd be like, look, has to be in Go ahead, go talk to him, right? So you gotta go talk to a bear. And we would talk to all kinds of things. And we would talk to things that we would, kill, we would have this relationship with it. Because there's another thing too, like let's say two people are going to go out hunting. Right, so in English you'd say, hey, follow them maybe. Are go hunting tomorrow? Yeah, sure. But in Klingi you would never talk about hunting. And there's two big reasons. One, because we know that animals can hear you. We just know that. That's, and, but these are things that people know things differently. They just do. And not everybody has to be the same. That's totally fine. But I could just be talking right here, and those things, they hear me. That's why I'm always careful. And we, we can have lots of jokes. We have lots of fun. But there's, there's lines that we don't cross, because we know that there's things everywhere. But if I said, <laughs> Those deer are going to hear us. They'll be like, later and they just take off. Also, just by talking about it, I might be assuming that I'm going to be successful. And you got to be careful and clink it to not, like when I said, like I made this amazing speech, like you got to be careful because that's stuff you really shouldn't do. Sometimes you can, you can have fun, you can joke around, but you got to be careful with stuff like that too. So there's, there's just certain things that we do. Right, there's certain ways that language is used. We can have a lot of fun and clink it if we know each other really well. All these, you know, come to my house and there's all, my auntie came over one time and she said, I was trying to get my daughter to eat her vegetables. She wouldn't eat her vegetables. I don't really like vegetables, so it's hard, it's hard for me to do it. Cause I'm like, you should. <laughs> so she's trying to, she's trying to get her to eat some asparagus. Go get the ha. And my auntie was there, and I forgot that she could understand Klingon. She doesn't speak it that much, but she can understand. She said, because I said, go ahead, eat it. And then later your pee is going to smell funny. Because <laughs> I thought she'd be curious, right? Kids are curious. And so my auntie says, 
That's not dinner time conversation. <laughs> so, okay, on to phrase number three, cruise around. So for things for it to precipitate, like it's snowing. Glade da wusetan. Glade da wusetan. Glade da wusetan. There was a guy who ran for school board. It's like, learn a phrase, get a 10 minute story. And he <laughs> said, uh, <laughs> He ran for school board and, and somebody asked him, would you support a Clinkett language immersion school? And he said, no, because you can't teach science through Clinkett. And I can't wait till we build our school and I could bring him into our science class. They're like, there, sucker. <laughs> but this word, doc, there, there's these words, um, who knows what a preposition is in English? You guys know what's a preposition? Usually describes like it's like a relational term, right? Like yeah, it's a relational on, term. Above, on, above, below, around, after, through, right beneath. They, and so usually, do they come before or after the noun that you're talking about? Before. Yeah. So you say, on the table. So clink it is the other way around. So if you want to just practice clink it grammar, just say that. So I was like, hey, may I see my cup? Yeah, it's table on. Right, just do that, just for fun. Because that's how we do it in Klingit. The dauk kuk. So um, this is one of those things. Dauk. Dauk. Uh, but there, there's a couple, there's, there's the way two things will relate to each other. And then we call them relational nouns. Right? Under, around, through. Uh, we've got words for all that stuff. But then there's these fixed points in the universe, right? Like you might know, and I think the ones for English are probably north, east, south, west. We don't use those terms. Like in Hawaii too, like if you wanna speak Hawaiian, forget about north, south, east, and west. You just go mountainside, oceanside, and then towards towns, right? And you can get anywhere. Same with here, you go uh, upstream or downstream, well, usually you're just talking about, you know, you got to manufacture that into north and south. For us, upstream is considered north, downstream is considered south. The real old school type of directions would be you're going to go inland towards the ocean or towards these areas that we know, right? So some of the things that we think about is these fixed points in the universe, the central point in the Clink universe is where the ocean meets the shore. Nietzsche. And all these old raven stories, Nietzsche, because that's, that's the center of our universe. Raven was walking on the beach. So you can go, like say we're right here in Ak, and the ocean is down there. The ocean is ocean work, right? So you can go from the inland, where we're at, to the ocean, you go from the ocean out to sea. You go from the sea to the shore. You go from the beach up to the inland. And the one you use depends on where you're at. So there's this whole set of these. This is one of them. Dock. 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 That means to go out to sea from the shore. It also means for precipitation to fall. It also means for something to come from the shadows out into the open. So you say snow falling only for precipitation is this word. Wusatun is precipitation. So now you can learn a whole bunch of words for types of precipitation. Siu is rain. Siu dot wusatun. It's raining. Kadats dot wusatun. It's hailing. Kakshahin da wusatan. Nuktatli da wusatan. So the last one was slush, or the, the one before that was slush, and then this one was uh, grouse turds. 
because sometimes those fall from the sky. We'll get to that. So then it was really snowing hard. You say, Glade your cow are done. Glade your cow are done. Glade your cow are done. So we're all inside. We're getting ready to go outside. And I was asking you, what's it like outside? And there was just a whole mess of, it just snowed a whole bunch. How would you describe that snow? In English. It's snowing heavily. <laughs> like it had already snowed. And so you're, you're telling me that the snow is, like we're going to go across it. Like we're going to go out and hike across the snow and you have to tell me how would you describe it? The fresh snow? Mm -hmm. Powder, it's either heavy or dry? Well, yeah, if there's a whole bunch of it, right? Because yeah. there's a whole bunch of it, you got to think about how you're going to walk across it, right? Like, you probably need some snowshoes. So you would say the snow is deep. deep, right? So that's what you'd say, right? And so that's the same way Clinkit takes care of it. So this last one, then we'll take a break. Glate Kadlan. Glate Kadlan. So Kadlan means deep. But there's only two things that could be deep like that. What do you think they are? The ocean, yeah, snow and water. Those are the only two things that could be but that's that's how you say it. You can't say you know, you could talk about being piled high, but if you're just sort of generally saying the snow's deep, the water's deep, so these are just kind of perspective things. Okay, five minute break. We'll do more late stuff. Are there a lot more words in Clinkit than there are in English for reasons like that? I don't know, like the word count. Um, I would say it's pretty safe to say there's probably a lot more verbs in mm -hmm. it than there are in English. Because sometimes it's got to, there's really specific verbs for really specific things. Like um, you could have a verb for cutting, but then there's a different verb for cutting open an animal. And then there's a very specific verb for removing the stuff from the, the cavity. Yeah. And it only works for that. Yeah. Um, so, like, Back before, like the like white people came and stuff, was there like an alphabet? Nope. Right. Everything was up here. Right. So that's was crazy. <laughs> There's this one elder. She said, she spoke Koyakon. She said, I could tell you a story. It takes ten days to tell. I just blows my. I can't. I can't even fathom that. Right? Like I could tell. What's the longest story you guys think you could tell? Yeah, right? So maybe you could tell it. Could you tell it for nine hours, like the movie's set is nine hours? I talk very slow. <laughs> I mean, that would just be, I mean, I don't know. I could probably tell a story that's an hour. Maybe, maybe an hour, that'd be, I feel like I'd be running out of stuff. So it's just interesting to think about that. Yes, and then, the amount of words and the amount of the grammar is super complicated. We haven't even gotten into that. And it's so fun to think about how this stuff was, how, it, how people came up with it, and how they transferred it. So when did they like, create that? It, they first started with Russian contacts, the late 1800s, mid 1800s. And then it really got refined to what it is uh, since 1970s about when it really took shape. So they had a whole bunch of different ways, like special symbols. And, so, and this is always a question for native languages. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they have their own symbols that they create, like Cherokee, they, they just have their whole set of symbols. And if you get a computer, uh, like so I say, OK, in my computer, I want to add a keyboard to this thing. And so I've got these input sources. And look, I've got Clinkit US. But I had to add Clinkit. 
doesn't come. But if you bought like just a Macintosh computer, uh, probably a PC as well, you can add this, and there's Cherokee. So you can add. It, it comes with Cherokee and a Hawaiian keyboard built in. So we got to try and get the. Yeah, so there's there's quite a few. Yeah, we got to get the, and the Clinkit one would work for quite a few languages. What other modern languages are 10, 15,000 years old? That's a good question. Right, like Hawaiian is probably a thousand years old. Maybe. Um, before that, it just goes into the string of Polynesian languages that um, a lot of. Uh, North American native languages you can probably trace back that far. But as far as being settled in one specific area, I think most of Alaska languages probably can root themselves about 10,000 years to very particular places. And then there's some of them that were like so these some of those inland languages were splitting away from each other too. It's always interesting like when did they split and then how how much separate did they Because some of them, they can still talk to each other. And that tells, you can guess that they didn't separate that long ago. Like you can look at Yupik and Sopiak, and a lot of people think maybe 500 years ago they separated. What a sense of where, where, like so, what, so there's language families, is there anything? Or is that like the... Just getting into the time immemorial at that point. That's so oh, cool. cool. So, right. English, so German... Is, yeah, this is like a... Yeah, so English, German, and Dutch, and Welsh, they all go back to the yeah, same yeah. origin. Yeah. But then, it, like, who knows, it gets really into the... Right. The soup of the, the collective mindset <laughs> at that point. But, and then they all go... And so it's really interesting to speculate. And sometimes the speculations are kind of wild, like... Mm -hmm. Trying to connect like Hebrew to Haida and so uh, like, no, mm -hmm. maybe. So, Lance, will you post this class? Yeah, it'll be on YouTube. Okay, will you post this class to the um, 2018 Intermediate Clinkit? Yeah, so usually if you go to Learning Clinkit and then Intermediate Clinkit, it'll pop up right there. It'll be on the top. Probably tonight. And then there'll be a, the slides will be there too from this. And I was curious about your Raven book. Stuff. It yeah. might be done this summer. Yeah. yeah, so most almost all the translation work is done. And that project, so I was sitting with Nora Downhauer when she was alive. And she was, I think, 85 maybe? And we're listening to a recording that was recorded in the 1960s by Frederica de Laguna. And the speaker was Nora Downhauer's mother's mother's father, mm. Kuchain Frank Italia. So I think he was born in probably 1880. And so we listened to him. And he was probably 80 years old when they recorded him. So it's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that should be coming. It's, it's, gonna, it's a big text. It's got lots of awesome stories. Okay, so I'm going to touch on a, a couple other things real quick. There's also a, a thing on here, you can see some abandoned projects. Uh, under resources, there's a bunch of stuff. There's a tab called place names. And then there's uh, a couple of projects that I was working on. Uh, and then c is doing amazing stuff, so I just sort of stopped. Um, the Chilku Chilcat storyboard is out of the Haynes Library. So basically, uh, this is a book, Tafit Kohas An Anisauko, our grandparents' names on the land. And it's got about 
3,300 place names recorded in Southeast Alaska. Uh, and this is probably about one third of the total documented names. And so uh, I learned to speak from my uncles and my dad always made like, always made, even like at the worst time, like something will happen and like it's like a, not like really serious, but like sometimes something will happen and I had to tell myself, this isn't funny. There's no joke here, right? And so I just tell myself not to make a joke. But the reason I say that is because there's a whole bunch of names in here. And some of the ones they don't put in here are one of the things that's just common knowledge for indigenous people in North America is if you publish something and you say there's uh, like a traditional medicine person buried there, somebody's going to go dig that person up and steal their stuff. That's just one of the realities that we live with. Uh, Walter Echo Hawk says, uh, if you dig up white people, you go to jail. If you dig up Indian people, you get a PhD. And so these are some things that we just sort of think about as indigenous people. Uh, the other, there's other ones too that might be just a little too, Clink it's funny, right? And there's some things that are funny in Clink it's that might not be funny in other languages. But those languages need to wake up and figure out what's funny. <laughs> So one of the things I was working on was this program, you know, Cardo. It was kind of interesting because with Google Maps, I was working at Google Maps for a while. What I was trying to do was just sort of create an interactive map so that you could walk and you could see that there's particular place names maybe in an area that you're at. So like here we are. So you could zoom in and you could see there's Ak, there's Qatini, there's uh, Yachteh. And, and there's these place names that exist, and I was hoping to develop something where you could just look at it on your phone and find the stuff. And I think there's still people that are going to do this. I just had to, I didn't have enough technology, you know, enough of the knowledge to do this stuff. Um, but then also, the University of Alaska Southeast got like this grant that we applied for from Google, but it was a weird, it's like, will give you access to $20,000 worth of software. But it really just, it was an interesting grant program. And then by the time I learned a few things about it, they discontinued the whole software set. <laughs> so I was like, well, I'm glad I didn't do too much. So I moved over to this other one called um, this Cardo program, which I like because you can sort of draw these polygons a little bit easier. It's just a little bit of a cleaner kind of map. I mean, you got some different options. But for example, and then I, what I wanted to have is, so you mouse over and you get the clinket name, you get the breakdown, like we talked about, there's these little things, right? And then you get the gloss, so we call it segment and gloss. Segment means you break it into its pieces, gloss means you define all those little pieces, and then you translate it after that. So for this one, uh, there's, there's really three parts to it. There's a, what we call an adverb. What does an adverb do? It modifies a verb. So it just modifies a verb, right? So like, say it. Say it carefully. Say it slowly, right? So those are, those are adverbs. They're just sort of saying, how are you going to do the verb? So this first one is an adverb, and it means very. Tuch. 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 And the second one is a positional verb. And so I said earlier, Clinkit likes to classify things. Clinkit is the, if you got like some OCD tendencies maybe, Clinkit was made for you. Because <laughs> you'd be like, what kind of thing is that, right? So th we got these things called carrying verbs. And a carrying verb means uh, you're, gonna, you're gonna pick it up, or you're gonna put it somewhere, you're gonna hand it somewhere, you're gonna, you're gonna do something with it, you're gonna handle it, carry it. And there's about 16 different carrying verbs because it tells you how to carry that particular thing. If this coffee cup is empty, I carry it differently than if it's full. Uh, if something is, you know, I would carry like a long, uh, let's say a paddle, I got like a long paddle, I gotta carry that thing differently than a pencil. Right? So built into the language is information on how to carry, how to handle that particular thing. And you get really fun things too because you've got all these different categories. You've got a general object, a round thing, 
something with complicated moving parts inside. You've got a hoop-like thing, like maybe a, a necklace or a drum. You've got uh, a, a stick-like thing that could be just a stick. A stick-like thing that's complicated, like a, a rifle. A small, one-hand stick-like thing, like a pencil. You've got uh, a rope that's coiled up. You've got a rope that's a big tangled mess. You've got a rope uh, that you're going to pick up by the by the the head of it, by the end of it. You've got fabric. You got a stack of things like a stack of towels. You've got an empty container, a full container. You've got a living creature, which is usually like a baby or a, like a pet. Because you would be like, hand me the wolverine, and then everybody dies, right? So <laughs> you also have like dead animals and sleeping babies, which are in the same category. Why do you think that is? Death and sleep are similar? It's similar, but I think with the, like let's say you're taking a nap, and I tried to pick you up for whatever reason, which would be really weird. You would wake up, right? You'd be like, what the hell? But you could pick up a baby, right? They, they just, they don't wake up. And so maybe that's, right? Um, and then you have carrying a bunch of different types of things. And then you have carrying personal items or luggage. And then you have carrying a whole, a whole bunch of one type of thing, maybe in a few different trips. So related to that is also these things to be laying there. People laying there. And this one is a stick-like thing to lay there. So that second part is satan. 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 So if there was like a broom, I would just be like, huh, anak sawit. At satan. Why is the broom just laying there? So this means it's really resting there. And the last part is hand. Jin. 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 This one... <laughs> We're getting, yeah, Chukun, we're getting to this part. Um, so this was the first place that we know of where a clinket name was put on, you know, restored. This is an interesting process because sometimes, like with the big Denali debate, people are like, "Why are they renaming the mountain?" It's like, "Oh, they're actually just unnaming it because it had this name." So this is a mountain that I think some of you guys might have been on. Heitzelman Ridge, I think, is what they call it. Thunder Mountain is also what they call it. And in Klinket, we call it Tachsetanjin. But if you didn't know those three different parts, it just sounds like a big, complicated word. But Tach, very, Setan, at rest, Jin. So it means hands at rest. And it has a secondary meaning, which is he doesn't masturbate. Right? So, <laughs> and it was funny because we were kind of talking about that amongst ourselves because we just happened to like, the, the politics just lined up that this was the first one we were going to try to do. <laughs> <laughs> and so we got the name, and we went through all these channels, and it was really fun. Uh, and we had to talk to this other family, and there was this kind of confusing moment where it seemed like we were at odds with each other, but we weren't, because they were going to try and put a person, you know. In, in English, you, you put a person's name, and 95% and maybe 98%, it's going to be a, named after a white man. It's gonna be some white man, Mendenhall, or, or something, and they're they're great. They're probably great people. They're probably important. But in Clinket, fewer than one percent of places are named after people. They're named after just something, right? Something we get there. It looks like something. Uh, you know, it's an important sort of set of stories. And so this was one that we just kind of picked because they're gonna put somebody's name on there. We're like, oh, let's not do that. It's like that thing has a name. Let's just keep the name that we already know. And then when the news, <laughs> they call, and they're like, what does it mean? It's like, Tach Satanjin, it means like hands at rest. And they said, does it mean anything else? And I said, no. <laughs> they probably say, you guys aren't naming anything anymore. <laughs> uh, so, so that's, does it, does Tach Satanjin, is that the whole Heinzelman bridge? That's the whole mountain. 
That's the whole mountain. The valleys. The the valley on on this side is um, Ashuyi, which is at the end of the board, and then the the valley on the other side, Shanachtlein, which is big valley, and that's the, what they call the Lemon Creek. That's right? Lemon. Yeah. And then so the Mendenhall Valley is Tashuyi. And then this area across where people like to go duck hunting or duck watching, whatever you're into, um, <laughs> is uh, Chukun Ani. Chukun Ani. And there's certain places where you're going to find a whole bunch of them, right? Where people know where that is when they're here. But there's probably a chukan ani in a bunch of different places because it really just means a field. Um, there's another one. If we get over, we kind of zoom into where we're at. Oops. So here we are. This place right over here is called Ak. 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 So that K on the end means little. It can also mean cute, right? And then uh, the ah means a lake, so it's a little lake. So we don't have to call it ah lake. We can just call it ah. Uh, uh. So one of the goals is to try and make a transition to just sort of acknowledging that there's a whole other language here, and we can use it. It's totally usable. Uh, and, and so running out of ah is this little place called Katini. 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 Kat is a sakai. Heen is water or river. There's a Katini be beside every village that there, you know, I think there's one beside every village. Because where are you going to build your village? Where the sakai run? Yes, right? Because there's the food right there. And so the other thing with Clinket is the lifestyle of the people is built right into the language. So, for example, to migrate somewhere, there's kind of three ways to talk about migrating. You could say, how uh, shagas. We, we picked up our house post and we brought it over to this place. That's kind of what it means. Gas is the root and it means a house post. You could say, uh, a day we went over there, but that verb means we took the sides of, because like, Clinkets lived in these long houses. So they put these big house posts in that we call gods, and they would carve things on them. Then they would have these, uh, they were built in a very specific way, but on the sides were a whole bunch of boards that could be removed in the summertime. Because you took them off so that the house could breathe, and you carried them somewhere and built your fish camp with them. And so the verb for going to migrate to your summer camp really means we picked up all these sticks and we carried them because you picked up all these boards. Uh, and then there's another one which was like uh, which would be we just left. And we didn't know. We were never coming back. Right? Um, so those are there. There's a whole bunch of really cool place names around Juno. There's a few of them here. Sit uh, is uh, the lake around the glacier, uh, Ak Sit is the glacier upland from Ak, and that's what they call Mendenhall, Mendenhall Glacier, Mendenhall, right? <laughs> okay, we'll do these ones kind of quick, but I'll put them up there so you guys can look at them because I want to do just some verb talk for the last 20 minutes when we scramble brains. And that's a snowstorm. And that verb means for something to be dry and lightly piled up. That's for something to be light and dry. Glade kaket. Glade kaket. 
Glade Kaket. That's uh, something to be ashy. Ket is the word for ash. Uh, and then when you get really fine snow, Glade Yetki. Glade Yetki. And that's snow babies. Oh, uh, oh, that one's on there twice. Glade Kauhu. Glade Kauhu. Glade Kauhu. So uh is to for something to blow. And so uh ja is the name for wind because it's always blowing. Uh, then you get some a couple of fun ones. Kowakan katisayi. Kowakan katisayi. So this is like the one that stares at a deer. I think is how I would translate it. Ruwakan is deer. It also means a peacemaker. Um, and then, like for example, like let's say two clans were fighting with each other, or, or they had some kind of argument. They had something that they couldn't come to a, agreement on. To resolve it, they might talk to somebody who's really pretty level-headed and say, you know, like, hey, Forrest, why don't you come solve this? And you would talk to our clan and talk to their clan. And you come back and say, okay, this is what needs to happen. And then we would give you this title, the Khan, right? And there'd usually be some name before it, like would say, Gunha Khan would be Abalone Peacemaker, or Degitgiya Khan, Hummingbird Peacemaker. And that would be a name we give you because you, you've made peace for us. Uh, and so that's a really important concept in Clinket. One time we were, we went to a cultural function, we and some friends, we were happy with how things went. We left and we're like, well, man, this is how they did it, blah, blah, so mad when they did this. And then we were just talking mad trash, which was not good. And we just saw this deer on the side of the road. And we're like, time to shut it. You know, so we just stopped. And then this one is large snowflakes that fall, especially in the, the kind of first snowfall, you tend to get these really big flakes that melt as soon as they hit the ground. And I've never watched a grouse poop, so I don't know if that's what they do. But that's called Nuktatli. Nuktatli. So Clinket has a bunch of, you know, the way that we name things. Sometimes, I don't know, we're a bunch of jokesters sometimes. We're real serious too, but Nuktatli is literally uh, grouse poop. But there are other things that might be hotly, like our word for honey is Gandetsaji hotly, which is bee poop. Right? And, and so it's not poop, it's the vomit. You know, someone's like, it's not actually poop. I'm like, I don't care, that's what we call it. Hot really means mess. So get your own language, right? <laughs> but I don't speak English to my kids. And it was fun because I was putting like, some honey and tea or something. And my daughter, she said, what is that? I said, Gandetsaji hotly. You too, I guess, It's bee poop. Do you want some? She said, no. <laughs> she didn't try honey for a while. And then the wet slushy snow, kakshahin, kakshahin, lumpy snow, sakhyetski, sakhyetski, little baby bones. I don't know why that one's called that one. Uh, a block of frozen snow, and this just means frozen snow. Kleit kashtik. Glade Kashtich. The crust on the snow is repeatedly frozen on top. Glade Kashtich. Glade Kashtich. And then snow that's falling into a pile. We'll just say, I'll say this one. It's fun. You guys could try. Akanach so k refers to just a space. Sha is the head of something. K is a surface of something. And then you get the rest of the verb. Uh, a and that's the wind is blowing the snow away 
And this is a repetitive suffix. There's different types in clinket. And this one means something that happens in a pattern, like sewing. Gleitka'uhu. 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 Oops, that's, I messed up. That's windblown snow. And then uh, on top of the snow, which means above the mouth of the snow, Gleit Chaki. Gleit Chaki. A lump of snow. Gleit Quat. Gleit Quat. Avalanche. Gleit Kadi. Gleit Kadi. And then so Gleit, so Teh is rock. So a landslide is called tekadi. So you just change. The, so the kadi part is the the big rush down the mountain. Glade shakadzu. Glade shakadzu. So I got to fix that middle part. This one is fun because zu is a verb root. Because uh, you to throw things, you could throw a, a single thing. You could throw a round thing. You could throw things that scatter, like paper. If you throw it, it kind of scatters. There's throwing uh, a, a person, because that's a little different, or a living thing. And then there's throwing something that you're using as a missile. That's what this one is. <laughs> so it's a whole different verb, because you'd say, hey, he's throwing rocks. Yeah, he's, he's throwing rocks at things, right? <laughs> he's using it as a missile. And then you can put sh on it, because you're trying to hit it in the head. <laughs> and so the word, when, the, when all that snow, when you see it fall off a tree, all at the same time, right? <laughs> That's like the snow head missile. It's such an awesome word. <laughs> right? It's, honest, it's fun when you're standing underneath. Okay, the last set of them. Uh, so it's snow and water falling at the same time. A kaukehin. Grain ball like snow is falling. Awasus. Snow ripples on the snow. Kasischa. The one that is blown around. That slush on the water, like when it's getting really kind of um, starting to melt on top of the water. Kanik. Or kanek. And then snow blindness is kashik. So there's our snow unit. Uh, thanks to that unit, it has snowed. So we're going to transition to this one, which we'll do uh, as much as we can. Uh, the Klinga verb is like a big scary thing. So I was trying to find like fun, scary things to put in there. So I've got a little monster in this guy that's terrified. So those of you in intermediate clinket, we're going to start really sort of getting to the nitty gritty of this thing. And we've talked around it. So that's how we sort of do clinket is we talk around it a lot and then we get to these sort of these big things. And for those of you who are new to clinket, this will give you a glimpse of some of the complexities because you've got things that are hard to pronounce. You've got all these categories of types of things all the time. It's always categorizing all these types of things. And then you've got like special verbs for certain things, and then you get the verb itself. And the clinket verb is a big, complicated, but fun monster. So we say, you know, kakwa'ak, or kakki'ak, yakki'ak. You're going to try, you're going to succeed. Our language is getting stronger. Our brain is getting stronger. This is a real mental exercise. When we do immersion activities, we do other things, we probably get really tired. I remember the first time I went to a Clinket language immersion, I'd take these naps. Like, I got to take a nap. I got like crazy headache. I'm so tired. And I would wake up, and it would take me a while to figure out where I was, what was going on, and how many days might have passed. Because it was like, but it would just be like a 20 minute nap. But Nora, she told me, she gave us a speech. And this is where you like you go to the old people. And we were at her, we went from her husband's funeral. And they were so close to each other, and they're both my teachers. 
to a meeting about how we're going to finish this Raven book. And she is the widow. And before, to start the meeting, she just pushes into this incredible speech. Incredible. And this was part of it. She said, which, and she told me how she would translate that, which is, you improve it by using the Clinket language. So for those of you who are learning, you just, you just keep using it, keep using it, keep it around you. And, and the English side of your brain is probably going to tell you, you're not making it, you're not going to do it, blah, 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 because it doesn't want to. Right? It doesn't. This is, this is facing the colonialism head on inside your own brain, inside your own spirit. So when we look at how a clinket verb is structured, to sort of make an abstract picture of it, we have something that comes before the verb, and then we've got a set of things that come in the same order every time. Object, thematic, conjugation, subject, classifier, stem. That's the order every time. Sometimes things are going to run into each other and start kind of changing each other a little bit, like going from cannot to can't, right? You're going to see that kind of business. But this is the order. So when we look at that, is it so blurry? the first one we want to sort of look at is the object. So there's a, there's a certain number of object pronouns that we can have. So we think about subjects and objects. Subject does it, the object, it's done to them. Right? So in English, who is the subject and the object is whom, right? So we know how to do this stuff, we just may not know the terms all the time. Right? So and, and some people get more particular about the stuff than others, right? So if you use the wrong pronoun then people know. Right? Say, me good Indian. Right? They just Oh, don't you mean I am a good Indian? Don't you mean just I'm a good person? But then also, if you use a pronoun, you know, so a lot of people, they'll use whom, they'll just try and use it and not really, not really sure, and it's a, it's, it's a little bit of a gray area sometimes, right? Are you the one whom was talking to, right? So that's the wrong use. It should be who. The one whom we were talking about, that's correct. But it's, it's sneaky stuff, right? So in Clinket, one of the fun things is the pronouns are built into the verb, and they cannot go away. <clears throat> For example, if I said, Kane uh, kicked the chair. Wow. But then if you just said, um, he kicked it. But once you say Kane and chair, the he and the it go away. But if we're going to use some clinket principles in English, we'd say, he kicked it, the chair. Those pronouns cannot go away. They cannot go away. Okay? They always stay built into the verb, and that's a sneaky thing. So as we go through these, there's a couple of different rules. Some of the rules are just sort of the way that we write clinket now. Some of these have to do with the way that things interact with each other. One of the things, if it's more than one letter, and it's an object, we tend to write it as its own separate word. Ha, ye, chat, ka, chush, at, those are all their own word. They'll be separate from the verb, even though they're, they're just part of the verb. We just write them separate. The i and the a and the k, they attach right onto the verb. Is the exception. If it ends with a consonant, it will not impact the verb itself. But if it ends with a vowel, it will create contraction. So we'll see this. There's these rules, and one of them is if you go out from the stem and you get three or more things, there must be contraction. Something has to go. This is just something that Clinkit will do every time. Let's just run through this list. So we also use these sort of codes. So we have first person singular, first person plural. So that's me, us. Second person singular, second person plural. You, y'all. Third person, so you get a singular and plural. He or she, them. 
Then you have a fourth person human, someone, and you have a fourth person non-human, something. You also have a reflexive, which means to the self, right? And so these are, English does not have reflexive verbs, but there's lots of other, or pronouns, but there's lots of other languages that do. I'm talking to myself. I'm looking at myself. I'm taking a selfie, right? Um, so let's just say, let's just say, so if we go through, and you know, first person means I'm talking about me, second person means I'm talking about you, third person means I'm talking to you about this other person. So going through the list, we have khat, ha, e, yi, a, ka, at, at, chush, chush, and shh. That's for the librarian out there. So seeing these in action, we take a verb which means to be good, right? To be fine, to be good. And like the context would be like, uh, and we gotta be careful, right? Because you don't wanna say, I'm really good at this, right? You, you try not to say things like that and clink it because one, it's culturally inappropriate, you know, to be like, man, I'm a really good basketball player, whatever. And maybe you are, right? But to say those things, also there's this cultural thing in Klinkit, we call one side Chagas, call the other side Jinnaha. So someone who walks around and says, I'm such a great basketball player, that's Chagas. They're, they're bragging about themselves in public. So that Jinnaha might be they're going to break their leg. Or the jinnaha might be something terrible is going to happen to their family. And that's a really clinket concept. Those two things are very closely related. But the context here is someone's like, how are you? I'm good, right? Something like that. So we'll see how these things look attached to a verb. Khat yake. Khat yake. Ha yake. Ha yake. Ha <laughs> Yeah. Any questions about that? Everybody okay? So that's just a... The other thing is Clinkit uses objects for state verbs, right? So we say a state verb is for something to be a certain way. But once you learn the pattern, then you could just learn a bunch of different verbs. Khatlitsin, I'm strong. Khatlitsan, I'm stinky. Khatbutlitsch, I'm dirty. Khatgenik, I'm sick. I'm good. These are all state verbs, right? And there's there's a whole list of them you can learn, and they all follow the same pattern, right? You stink. Sometimes when people ask me, "What's that?" I say, "Eat it." But when I just say "yakeh does it sound like I'm referring to myself in the third person? You should. I, I think in the in the context it works. You know, so like. The other thing, as we learn Clinkit, we usually learn an artificial Clinkit, right? And, and some people some people get upset by that. And they talk about this in Hawaii. They say, we don't talk with Hawaiians. Later you will. But first you've got to do this whole language stuff. So if someone says, hey, how are you doing? Right? That's not how people talk. That's it. That's like, how's it going? Right? Or how is it? And, and then you'd be like, good. Right? But you I am good. How are you? But when you're learning a language, that's usually the type of stuff you do. Okay. So, I think in that context, yake okay, is fine. That's how I hear the old people. Say. One time we, we did a class here in 1999. It's like Prince predicted. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they really encouraged us to speak clinket to each other. We stayed in the dorms. They were the only dorms that were up there. They didn't have this fancy dorm. And then, uh, they said, just be clinking to each other. So I was like, okay, okay. 
So I saw this elder. I was like, what's that, Yeti? She said, good. I mean, yuck, hey. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, well. so looking at this with uh, a more active verb, and you could, so really what you do is a process. The process is you learn to practice a bunch of different object pronouns, a bunch of different subject pronouns, then a bunch of combinations. And it drives you crazy, but this is the stuff you've got to do. Because in English, they're separate words, right? I love you. I don't love you. But in, in Klinkit, you'd say, Ich sechan, kesh ich sechan. Right? And so they, they change, but they, they're right next to each other, and they're built into the verb. So, love is a good one. And so when I did the love verbs, it was so fun. This elder I love, love to work with. Uh, who passed away in December. And I did a whole, I was like, and I just ran through every, I just did every combination I could think of. I love you. I love him or her. I love y'all. I love them. I love people. I love something. You love them. You know, I just did all these combinations. I was like, okay, now I gotta do the negative ones. I don't love you. <laughs> His wife was in the next room. She goes, Ishan, which means like, poor thing. So, so now I'm the object of affection, lucky me. Chatsechan. Hasechan. Isechan. Yisechan. Asechan. Kusechan. Atsechan. Hasechan. So you see that sechan part isn't changing. Se and chan. Those are two parts of the verb, the classifier and the stem. They're not changing, they're staying the same, and all that's changing right now is the subject or the object pronoun. So now you can learn how you can learn how to do the subject pronoun and it affects things. But languages, all languages have their own sort of ambiguities, right? And so this is why people might have trouble, like they're texting each other and then there's some miscommunication. There's a really funny key and peel video called like text fight or something. It's, it's funny. It's silly, but it's funny. But it's a similar type of thing where maybe like some big argument happens, but it just turns out they're, they just don't clearly understand each other. So one of those realms with English, or with Klinkit is Isechan. So this one right here, oops, that could mean I love you, or I love him or her, or she or he loves me. There's no way to tell the difference. You just have to, but you just give it some context. Right? Just give it some context. The other one is has asechan, the third person plural. That could mean he or she loves them, they love him or her, they love them. And it's impossible to tell. It's just impossible. So you but you can do it with putting stuff around the verb. Right? So this is just some of the some of the areas in Clinket that you just gotta do a little bit extra work. Okay. So the next thing that Clinkit has is what we call thematic prefixes. So a thematic prefix is a small thing that gets added onto a verb, and if you add that to a verb, you have made a totally new verb. It's a totally new verb. And that, that little thing has meaning. So the object has meaning, because it's saying who it's happening to. The subject has meaning, who's doing it. The conjugation stuff, which we'll talk about uh, maybe Thursday, but maybe next week. That's just to put the verb into different modes. This is, this is the key to using verbs in Clinket. You put it into different modes, which in English would say past tense, future, right? But that, that verb, um, well, let's say uh, the verb is strong, right? Hitzin, he or she is strong. That's right now. Wushitzin. He or she became strong. He or she's going to be strong. He or she's getting strong right now. So they're called modes, and that means we're just talking, and, and this, this is a big difference between English and Klinket. English is concerned about when the verb happened. That's what it, it communicates a lot, is time. English, I mean, Klinket, doesn't care about time. It is only concerned with whether or not the verb has happened. You could still talk about time, 
But this is where people got confused when they first encountered clinket. They said they didn't conjugate their verbs for time, which was true, but there's certain things, right? Like, so I say, wish it seen. If we just said, okay, that's a past tense thing. No, it's not. It means it has achieved that. It became that. So it, it, it's a bigger, larger discussion. But for now, just remember, clinket does not conjugate for time. It conjugates for event, whether or not the verb has happened. This is why you say something like, yisakuge, and the Y on there shows that the perfective marker which is similar to like the ED marker, but totally different. And that's just because you gotta, you achieve this state. You gotta know it to know it, right? Yisik, because a lot of people say isakuge, but it's actually yisakuge, because that perfective marker needs to be there. Okay, that one maybe I took too far. So there's these three lists, and, and thematic, there's these three thematic spaces. When I think of verbs, I used to think of them as like little toy blocks. And I was like, oh, maybe they're not toy blocks. Oh, they're like a slot machine. So like there's a slot machine, right? And so you could say cherry, 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 big winner, whatever it is, right? Cherry, apple, whatever they are. But once that thing is set, there, it, there's, only one, there's only one wheel. And the wheel could turn, there's different things on the wheel. That's how these spots work. And they go in this order. There's the first one, the second one, the third one. You can have up to three of them but if they're on the same list, they can't both be there. Right? And we'll see, we'll see it later. We'll see it later. For now, all of these mean something. So the first one is oh. Oh. And that's relating to some kind of space, right? Some given area. Ka. Ka. And that's comparing two different things. J. 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 That's a hand or possession. T. T. Inside of something. S. 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 A voice. S. S. A nose or a point or a beak. Da. 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 Around or about something. K. A. a mouth. But it's just an opening. So I can clink it. You get, you get two of them. I guess what the second one is. Sh. It's a head. Sh. Sh. It's the end of something. Ah. Uh. It's what we call athematic. It's a bigger thing. We'll look at it later. Ka. 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 A round or spherical thing. Ka. 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 A horizontal surface. You just, you just, you'll know which one it is. Unfortunately, they're the same. It's got to be one or the other. But they sound exactly the same. And they're in the same location. Ya. Yeah. 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 the vertical surface of something. So to see how some of these uh, could work, like here's some different verbs to show how they change when we change the thematic prefix. So they are different verbs. Yak a. He, she, or it is good. Kuwak a. The weather is good. Yati. It, 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 it is, usually like it's, it is some certain way, right? To be. Kudziti. He or she or it exists. Ahuha. She here it disappeared. Atkuwaha. It's the time for it, like a season or, you know. Yage. It's big or many. Ye kuge. The salmon was this big, right? Sikak. It's thick, like a board or like this table, right? The door. Yuk sikak. It's this, so you're comparing it to something, right? That's what that one's doing. Nashle. Ye kun nashle. So when you say nashe, you're saying it's far, right, between here and there. But if you're saying like three days travel or four miles or whatever, ye could nashe. It's this far. You're specifying something. Ye jine. She or he is working. You too were tunk. Thinking. Say wa ach. 
Heard a voice. Oops. Asewa ach. Asewa ach. Shua shash. Like a pencil got worn down. Ye a dayaka. And this one means like she here is saying this specific thing. You kayatunk. She or he is speaking. A shawa hitch. She or he clubbed him or her or it on the head. Shubahi. It ran out. It died. It's all done. A He or she is dancing. So you can see how the meaning is there. So working has to do with your hands. Thinking is inside your head. A voice, you can hear it. Um, the point of something. About it, talking about it. Communication through the mouth. Hitting it on the head. Running to the end of it. Uh, Throw in like a rock, maybe. Throwing a basketball. Awakash. Cutting. She or, she or he saw it wood, maybe. Akawakash. So the first one would be cutting, like I'm cutting uh, uh, some meat or something. Akawakash would mean I cut it up into cubes. Tisha'an. She or he is kind, so that's inside. Yaksa'an. They're, they're attractive. They're good looking. Okay, and then we got the subjects, but I think we're quite out of time. So the subjects is where we'd start sort of saying, now this is someone doing things, right? So I did it, you did it, or I did it, we did it, you did it, y'all did it, she or he did it, they did it, it happened. And that's how Clinkett takes care of things. Um, any questions? We have 30 seconds. I have a question. Yeah. Okay, so, Quinkit is not concerned with pets and is concerned with that. Yeah. And do you think that relates to the continuity of the language over those thousands of years? It's just more like looking at whether or not something happened is so important in Klinkit. And when it happened is not. And so when you, when you look at how Klinkit takes care of time, the, the way that it sort of increments things out, like a long time ago before that, there was just sort of like yesterday, you know, there's like a while ago, yesterday, the day before, months ago, years ago. Then there's these big chunks, like chalk, which would be long time ago. But most of the people, like the oldest people, were still alive then. Pagu is sort of back when all these oldest people weren't even born, all the way back to the beginning of time. So then you got these huge chunks like that, where it just gets, and there's certain points of information that we know, and there's stuff that we know that's fairly recent, and then there's stuff that we know that's nobody knows how long ago that was. So it has to do with the collective memory of people, mm -hmm. I think. But it's really fun because there's certain things where I could say, which is I see you. And so we put it into this perfective thing. And so you say, it's good. It was good. means I see you. But could also mean I saw you. So it gets... It's, it's a big conversation, it's something that we spend a lot of time just sort of looking at, thinking about. I think when people first hear it, they maybe kind of get hung up on it because it's, it's hard to think of a language functioning without considering time. And it's not like Klingit doesn't consider time, but it's just not really an important thing. It's just outside of this linear chronology of... Right, and, th and then there's ways to sort of the, the way that languages take care of time is really interesting because in Clinket, you could say which is all day, 
So shtekat means all. Yagi means a day. So all day. But it doesn't mean every day. It's a tuk yagi, because tuk means um, every time. So there's different things. You say, say, shtekat yagi yejechane. I'm, I'm working all day. Tuk yagi yejechane. I'm working every day. I'm hustling, right? So there's different things that you can say, but it takes a while to think about that stuff. Also, um, Klinget has these things like day and dach, towards and from, and the, the things with location work the same as time. Oh. So you could say, dech, dech, ki dach away, from two days ago. And then you could say, hit dach, from that house, and it's the same. You know, but English is the same thing. Time, time is really fun. But time is really important for people because it's like, what do you use language for? Tell stories, tell jokes, do stuff like that. Yeah, what? Goodness, chi, shuhan. Okay, we'll talk about this more on Thursday. We'll have some time to reflect before we go into full insane immersion. Goodness, chi, Yeah. What's that? Socrat. God. God. And this is for you. Oh, right on. Yeah.